All right. I just got some more uh, prayer requests. And this is what we're here for, to seek our Heavenly Father. A uh, brother in the back has a friend who, uh, who, who just had a baby, and there's a hole in the, in the baby's heart. So we want to keep that situation lifted up. Um, our brother George uh, that comes here, George and Amy. George had an accident, crushed his ankle. And then um, our sister Sharonda here, uh, she's got some issues going on with her spine in a few different places and also waiting on some results for some things they found in her neck. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you know all things. So we thank you for test results that will come back clean. We thank you for a heart that's going to be healed. And we thank you for an ankle that's going to be fixed. And God, I pray that you use all three of those instances for your glory. For your glory, not ours. But I pray, Father, in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ, that you would not find us silent on the praise. But just as much as we ask for a miracle, that much more may we be committed to give thanks. And so we trust in your plan, and we walk in your will. Father, we lift up this opportunity to get into your word together as a family. We ask for wisdom, for guidance, for knowledge, discernment by the power of your Holy Spirit. This is the day that you've made, and our job is to rejoice and be glad in it. May we leave here changed for your glory. May every ear be willing to receive. May every eye be able to see the truth. May every person feel your holy touch. Have your way here. Your word says in 1 Samuel 2.30 that if we honor you, you will honor us in return. In the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said together, church. Amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. Turn in your Bibles, please, church, to the book of Acts, chapter 8. Acts, chapter 8. I'm going to see something that happened in the life of a gentleman named Philip. Acts chapter 8, we're going to begin with the 26th verse. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, verse 26, when you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Yeah. To God be the glory. We're going, to, we're going to read for a little bit, so hang in there. Follow along on the wall if you do not have your Bible in front of you. <clears throat> or share with your neighbor. Acts chapter 8, beginning with the 26th verse, God's word says the following. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, 
So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch, in verse 34, asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about who, church? Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Verse 39. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Verse 40. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. All right, stop right there for a minute. Let's talk about what, what, what is happening here in the scripture and see how we can take what has gone on in the life of Philip and how we can apply it to what's going on with you and me. Amen? Everybody ready? Amen. If your neighbor didn't say nothing, look at him and say, you know better. <laughs> you go to a restaurant, you should be ready to what? You come to church, you should be ready to what? Amen. You can come for milk or you can come for meat, whatever you're ready for spiritually. But if you want meat, you can eat. Amen. All right. Whew. Notice what happens, church, within the first two verses. Look at it, please. Acts, beginning with the 26th verse. We're going to look at what happens in the first two for just a moment. In the 26th verse, an angel comes down and tells Philip to go. And then if you look at the 27th verse of Acts chapter 8, verse 27 tells us that Philip went. So the angel says go, Philip goes, which means Philip was obedient to the call of God. He was obedient in the plan that God had for him in that very moment. Now understand this, the plan could have very well been uncomfortable for Philip because according to the word of God, the plan was a desert road. It was a desert road, a desert road that Philip was told that he had to go down. Now, sure, this was going to be out of Philip's normal, considering he was just preaching in a town. This lonely desert road was going to be something that maybe he knew nothing about, whether he did or didn't. It does not matter at this point. But the fact of the matter is, he was doing something real good. There was people around. There was a busyness around. And all of a sudden, the Word of God shows up by way of an angel and says, Hey! Go down to that place that is down the desert, what, church? Road. How many people have felt led by the Spirit to do something that you've never done before? Maybe you were uncomfortable in doing it. You know what happens when God leads us down desert roads in life? It's not to make us feel empty, although at times we may. It's not to make us feel confused, although at times we may. It's not to feel lonely, although at times we may. But when God sends us down a desert road, it's always, always, always to make us stronger for his glory. Always. He never leaves us, nor what? The angel comes and tells Philip, go down that road, the desert road. I want to show you what Philip left behind when the angel came up and said, go to the desert road. Let's look at what Philip left behind. Acts chapter 8, look at the fourth verse for a moment. This is interesting. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Let's look at what Philip is leaving. Because it's real easy to be comfortable and remain where we are. And if we're honest with one another, a lot of times comfortableness can cause us to be out of the plan of God. Anybody with me on that? Being comfortable can call us to miss the plan. Look at what Philip's got going on right here. Acts chapter 8, beginning with the fourth verse, says this, church. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Tell your neighbor, that should be us. <clears throat> We should preach the word wherever we go. We wake up, go to work. There's people there that need to hear the word. We wake up, we go to the grocery store. There's people there that need to hear the word. Amen? We wake up in our own homes. There's people there that need to hear the what? Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. So he's preaching in this city. Verse 6. 
When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Think about this, church. Philip was comfortable. God was working miracles through Philip at that time. He was, Philip was preaching to the crowds, and according to the sixth verse, large crowds were not only coming, but large crowds were actually listening to the gospel. Philip had it made in that moment. How many people have been in a moment where you felt comfortable and God wanted you to leave? See, it's kind of like when you go up to a buffet. Brother Don took me to a buffet the other night. I had something for lunch that didn't settle real well, but he took me to dinner. And it was my favorite place on earth other than church. It was the Golden Corral. And I said, man, this brother's willing to pay for my dinner. I, got, I really got to give my money's worth here because you want know, his money's worth anyway. And so even though lunch wasn't settling too good, I knew that when you go to a buffet, you go there to what church? I did my best, had to really skip dessert, and he kind of looked at me and said, son, that all you going to do? I was in a comfortable place of the Golden Corral Buffet. Had two choices. I could get up and leave because I knew I had had my full and be blessed by going home to be with my family. Or I could stay where I was comfortable for the past 45 minutes, overdo it, and get too much. Why do I say that? Listen to this parallel, okay? Listen to this parallel. Sometimes as Christians, we receive what God has for us. It is so comfortable that we remain in the moment for so long that in essence, the moment has since passed. But we still are trying to live in the moment. The moment's no longer in the present. The moment is in the past. And we're trying to currently live today what God was doing through us yesterday. Tell your neighbor, be careful. Because as long as I'm living in what God wanted me to do yesterday, I'm not going to be able to receive the blessing of and there's nothing wrong with seasons. You, your season could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year. But sooner or later, listen, a season is never forever. A season is never forever. That's why it's called what? Philip could have been real comfortable in the season that he was currently in. He could have said, what? What's that to the angel? You mean, you mean I got to leave? Well, wait a minute. God, God is just doing miracles right here. God would not want me to leave this. How many people's argued with God before? Right? If you didn't raise your hand, you're probably arguing right now not to raise your hand. But, 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 but God, this, this, this is so comfortable. I mean, look, look, angel, go back and tell God that, that, that miracles are happening by, by the power of his spirit. God knows what he's doing. But, 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 but I'm preaching and people are receiving. God knows what he's doing. But, but, but not only are they receiving, they're hearing and lives are being changed. God knows what he's doing. And if God was doing all of that in that one moment, in that one city, don't you think if God says get up and go here, that the same thing that was erupting here can now transpire there? Philip could have easily said, no, nah, God, no, uh, God, you're, you're missing it. I'm going to stay here. Say, neighbor, God never misses it. Praise God, because what's so wonderful about this story is the blessing and the obedience, because whenever you're obedient, there's going to be a blessing. Whenever you're obedient to the word of God, to the will of God, the plan of God, there's always going to be a blessing. It's God's nature. You sow seed, you get fruit. And so when you sow the seed of faithfulness to the one who created you, when you sow seed of faithfulness, God will reap a harvest of blessing. However, Philip could have just as easily been sowing a seed of disobedience and say, no, 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 God, that, that, that is not for me. That is not my style. I do not hang out with those types of people. We, 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 we just don't mesh well together. Then what happens when we sow a seed of disobedience, every seed's going to bear fruit. It's either going to be good or it's going to be bad. 
And so we have to be careful. Philip immediately, immediately, Philip knew, okay, he said go, I got to what? See, the reason Philip knew immediately to leave was because he was in tune with his relationship with the Father. And when you're so in tune with the relationship to your heavenly Father that when the Spirit leads you go, you just what? You remember Peter was on the boat and the storms rose up and Peter said, Lord, bid me what? Praise the Lord, that one woman right there knew it. Gold star for the lady in the second row. <laughs> All right, for everybody else who's already heard the answer, the answer is come. So, so Peter wanted to get out of the boat, and he said, bid me what? Now, don't you feel good now? And all of a sudden, the Lord said what? And, and I preached on this numerous times, but let me just, for the sake of what Philip was going through, uh, see, we talk about Peter taking his eyes off of Jesus and onto the storm, but don't forget, Peter walked on water for a little bit. A lot of people say, oh, Peter, 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 he sank. Well, when's the last time you walked on some? Because according to Scripture, Peter actually walked towards, according to Scripture, he walked on the water towards Jesus. And so we don't know for how many steps, but for at least some steps, he was strutting on top of the blue stuff. See, if we're willing to be bid come, God's willing to do whatever it takes to get us to where he wants us. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, we, we cannot, we absolutely must not look at the what ifs or the have nots because God's got all the answers to the what ifs and God's got every provision for the what nots. And so Philip knew this. So when the angel of the Lord came down and said, Philip, Leave the miraculous signs here. Leave the word that you're teaching here. Leave the people that are receiving here. And I want you to go down the desert road where nobody's at. You want to know why I truly think Philip knew he should go down that desert road? Because he knew the God he serves was doing so much incredible stuff right here that if he's ready to pull me out of this, something real cool is going to be the end of that dirt road. I'm going to see it. If it's so important that he's plucked me out of this season and thrust me into this one, it's worth going. It's worth going. How many people, and don't point, just raise your hand. How many people, someone calls your cell phone and you're tired of them calling your cell phone and you don't pick up for them in that moment? Don't point. Especially if it's a person sitting beside you. You, you, you ever... You ever had a, a, a friendship with someone, and not to say that the friendship's over, but the closeness of the friendship, the intimacy of the friendship, if you will, between, between two sisters in Christ or two brothers in the Lord, have you, have you ever just knew it was just done on that level? God brought you together for a season, and then you got to go meet someone else for a new one. And that's okay. Philip's at the point where he's actually torn loose from what was so good, and he's torn loose from what was so good to receive something so great down the road. Very interesting, because Philip was comfortable, but he was willing to get uncomfortable by stepping into the will of the unknown. God then called Philip out of all of that. He said, go down the desert road. Now listen, church, if God's going to call you out of your comfort zone, all right, not for the purpose of making you uncomfortable, but rather for the purpose of strengthening you. And God will even call you into the realm of uncomfortable to strengthen people around you to see how you act, react, and adjust to the uncomfortable. God will use you to bless others. He will use you to strengthen others. He will use you to teach others. And that's a lot of times why we have to leave the realm of comfortable because someone new needs to hear what we're talking about. Philip could have easily stayed in the same group of people. But God said, in essence, you've been faithful. I'm going to carry you over here to those who need to hear. I want to show you something in Scripture. Turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 27 for a moment, please, church. Acts 8, 27. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Before we read, you, you need to understand this, and, and, and trust me on this, church. Trust me on this. 
You would rather go where God says go and be uncomfortable than be comfortable in disobedience and remaining where he wanted you to leave. Everybody hear that? You would rather go, trust me, you would rather go where God says go and be uncomfortable rather than be comfortable and stay where you are. I'm a big believer in this. Uh, uh, I don't beg people to come to church, and I don't beg people to stay at church. And you say, well, pastor, that's silly. You need people in the church, don't you? No, I need God in the church who God wants in this church, but I want people in that church down that road who God wants in that church down that road. I want people in that church over there who God wants in that church over there. But as long as people are not in the house where God has called them, then the house where they should be is missing the edification and the blessing of their gifting that God has equipped with them with to go be in that house. Amen? Amen? See, I mean, it, 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 it really, it really is, it's never been about numbers to me. When this ministry first started, it was like 10 or 11 of us in my living room. It, it was never about people. If we came next Sunday and 100% of the people that are here were gone, I would know that God was sending more folks. And it's okay. We're, I, I'm, not, I'm not stressed out about the people because just as much, just as much as, 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 as the angel looked at Philip and said, leave these folks and go preach to someone down that dirt road. The number does not matter. I'd rather have 15 faithful sold out servants of Christ than 5,000 who were fake. Because 15 faithful can do more than 5,000 all day long. See, it's the essence of the faithfulness, not of the amount of hands. 5,000 idle hands are dangerous and the enemy's playground, but you give me a set of 30 faithful hands. Watch out. Watch out. 5,000 mouths idly standing by are dangerous, but you give me 50 faithful ones. Watch out. See, Philip knew that it was all about obedience to the Father, and when he says, go down that dirt road, he never questioned it once. He picked up and he went down to what church? It may not have been the prettiest street coming out of that city. It may have been the emptiest block on the get-go. And for a while, it may have been the loneliest travel to, path to travel. But Philip got to the point to where he just knew God is in control. And when my father says, go down that empty road, it ain't going to be empty for long because he's got purpose in my life. And he's not going to send me down a road with no plan, no will, or no purpose. And I may not see it right away, but sooner or later, I'm going to know why I'm here. See, a lot of times when God calls me to do something and I don't have the answer right away, I get excited waiting for the outcome to transpire. Okay, well, let's go. We're going to step out in faith, and then well, what's the reason? Don't need to know it right now, but sooner or later, we what? We will know. All right, Acts chapter 8. We're going to start out with the 27th verse. Everybody there? Thank you for the three who bought your Bibles. Acts chapter 8, the 27th verse says this. Speaking of Philip. So he started out. Tell your neighbor, you just got to go. I mean, the angel said, go in the very next verse. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit, capital S, and the Spirit of God told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Stop right there, church. Two things to take note of here that we, we too should use when we witness to others. Two very important things that are critical here. Number one, Philip went to the Ethiopian's chariot, okay? Now, now, now listen, church, if you want to lead the lost to Jesus, they don't always fall out of the clouds and land in your lap. Amen? If, 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 if you... All right. How many people in here have steel-toed boots on? Amen. Two. Anybody else? Three. Four. All right. Ladies, what's up? 
Got my steel toe heels. All right. This is going to hurt a little bit, but it's the truth. This is going to hurt a little bit, but it's the truth. Let me come to this side and say it. This is going to hurt a little bit, but it's the truth. Everybody ready? If you've not witnessed the gospel to someone in the past month, there's a problem. If you've not witnessed the gospel to someone in the past two months, there's a problem. If you've not talked about Jesus and offered salvation in the last year, there's a huge problem. But see, that's the predicament and the epidemic that the church has found itself in. We stay shut up, clammed up, wrapped up, warped up. And that's exactly why the political system is where it is today. Not just recently, it's been jacked up for 50 or 60 years. We're too quiet when it comes to truth. All right, everybody hold on because it's really going to hurt. This is gonna, this is gonna penetrate the steel toes. Everybody ready for this? If you've not led someone to Jesus in the past year, there's a major problem. Oh, Pastor, I'm no preacher. No, but if you're a child of God, that's all you need. Well, how do you know that? Because if you've been saved, the Holy Spirit comes and enters inside of you, and He has equipped you according to Scripture with every good what? everything that you need, the Spirit of God gives to you. And the problem with the church today is, is that we let the pastor and the leaders minister the gospel, and the church just shows up. And, 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 and too, many, too many generations have come to church not understanding that they're the church, not the pastor. And when they leave, they're to proclaim what they learned and they received. They're to take out with them and share to everybody they know. See, the people that you go to work with tomorrow morning, you should have such a reputation. I'm just telling you how to be a true Christian at your place where you work. You should have such a reputation at your place that when a, a business that when you show up to work tomorrow, they already know that they're going to hear what the pastor taught you. There should be some people running from you. Let me, let me, let me get the sledgehammer on this one. Everybody ready for this? Because I say this with love. I say this with love. If everybody in your inner circle is unsaved and they're not running from you, you're too soft with them. You should love them so much that according to Scripture, we should be trying to rescue them from the flames. They should know what you're coming with because you love them so much. Let me just use you for an example. Uh, praise God, my brother saved right here. Amen. But let, let me use him for example. Let's pretend he wasn't saved and me and him work with one another. He should be running from me every Sunday or every Monday because he knows I'm coming for him. Why? Not because I'm after him, but because I love him. Because I love him. Brother, don't you understand? You got a wife at home. You got a baby at home. You should be being the head of that home. You should be loving them in this, into the truth. You should be bringing them into the word. I'm telling you, you got to be saved. Here's where most Christians are missing it. They got to tell them the truth. And brother, if you're not saved, there's hell for eternity. But I'm telling you, if you're willing to let Jesus save your soul, you can skip all of that. No one's telling the truth. That's why not everybody's clapping. See, listen to this. this. This is where it gets heavy. And this is why I want you to understand. Philip went to the chariot. God didn't call the man in the chariot to the revival that was happening in the city of Samaria, did he? Everybody hear that? See, not everybody's going to come inside your church. This is why God will call you to where they what? Are at. And so God told Philip by way of, uh, he told Philip by way of the angel to come down the desert road. When the faithfulness in him took him down the desert road, God himself, according to scripture, it says the spirit of God, capital S, the spirit told him, go stand near the chariot. Some of us need to stand next to the cubicle a little bit more, the person that we so-called love, but they're unsaved. We need to, some of us need to wait for them at their vehicle when they're getting off work. Some of us need to wait for them at the time clock when they're getting ready to punch out. Because according to the Scripture, listen, according to the Scripture, their blood will be on our hands if we do not administer the truth. 
I don't want anybody, I don't want anybody on the day of judgment to be standing there and look over at me and say, man, you're a pastor. Why didn't you tell me? And I'm not perfect at it all the time. But this is one reason when we go to the grocery store, I love to look at someone and say, hey, you go to church anywhere? And of course, that holds no validity to me because there's tons of people that go to church. They play church. They're not saved. But that's just the opener. Oh, you go to church? What church you go to? You'd be surprised the amount of people that don't know the church. They just claim they went to. Uh, uh, uh. But grandma took me 10 years ago. Question number three. This is the most important one. You say Question number four, how do you know? Because if you can't tell me, I got a hard time believing it. Well, I said the prayer when I was like 12. <sighs> That's a whole nother sermon. Don't take me down that road right now. I told you this I was busy. There was faithfulness in Philip. Look, look, look. Look at number two. I told you there were two things that we need to pull from, from that verse. Number one was Philip went to the chariot of the Ethiopian. So he met him where he was. Number two is this. It is a very strategic strategy. Listen, Philip not only met the man where he was in his physical location, but he also met the need of the man where he currently was in his mental and spiritual location. The man currently had a need. He had a need, and Philip came and met the need. The man was wondering, and Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? It was a need the man had, and the man said, no, no, no. How can I unless someone what? Teach me and tell me. So you want to help people understand how good Jesus is? Then present Jesus to them in their current circumstance. Oh, you, you, you're going through something, sister? Well, I'll tell you what. Rather than me sit here and tell you about God parting the Red Sea and rather than me sit here and telling you about, you know, Moses and rather, rather than me sit here and tell you about Lazarus raised up from the dead, you know, we pull back all them great stories. Let me just tell you what Jesus can do with your current situation. See, we're going to believe in faith and we're going to be praying together and I'm going to have some saints in the church praying and, and we're going we to be praying that those results come back good. And as far as the spine goes, we just go believe in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ that when you wake up in the morning, that thing's going to be straight. Ain't nobody going to have to help you get out of bed. You're going to be able to do it on your own because of the authority in Jesus Christ that lives in you. Glory. See, see, we have to get to the point, church, to where we, I'm not, I'm not just trying to tell you the, the great things about God in the scripture. I want to tell you the great things about God today. Today. The reason many people never enter into the doors of church is because they feel like church is not relevant to their lives. And the reason they feel like church is not relevant to their lives is because the church is not making it relevant. We got to administer the good news in the comfortable places and in the uncomfortable places, in the crowded places, and even on the desert road. Something else happens that really just blows my mind here. It really is a beautiful thing in this, in this part of Scripture. I want to take you there. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3 for a minute, church. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to begin with the 13th verse. If you're looking for 1 Peter, it's just before 2 Peter. Amen? Good way to find it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Well, by the, by the grace of God, we will. It's his word. And this is what it says. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with the 13th verse. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are what, church? Blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, set apart Christ as who? I would think about that. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give a what? Mm. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 
respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, verse 17, it is better if God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing what? Yeah, stop right there for just a moment. In the middle of the 15th verse, if you look at it, please, in the middle of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says the following. It tells us, always be prepared to give a what? Listen, you got to know what Jesus has done for you. You may not know all of it, and I understand that. I don't even know all of it because that's how good God is. But you got to be ready to tell someone about Jesus and what he's done now. Not 1,000 years ago, not 2,000 years ago, not 3,000 years ago. we got to be able to tell them what Jesus is doing right now. And listen, I- I'm excited about telling you what Jesus is doing right now because that lets you know that he's alive, he's living, he's well, he's active. His word is sharper than any double-edged sword. I'm telling you, he's with me today. And if you're willing to receive him, he'll be with you today as well. Do you want it? Do you want it? Because if you do, you can have it. And you can have all of it. See, in this latter day, how many people, by show of hands, how many people realize that we are blessed to live in the latter day? I mean, it's incredible. See, what we're seeing, the the saints of old, the prophets of old, the patriarchs of old, they long to live to see with their own eyes. We are favored to be in this moment. I mean, think about it. And do you realize that, that there is a potential in this very moment that when you walk out of those doors, for all you know, heading to your vehicle, that you are about to hear a shofar in the eastern sky split? That's the moment you're living in. I mean, this is exciting stuff. I mean, that's the moment we're living in. I mean, this is cool stuff. They don't teach this in public school. They don't teach this in unchristian colleges. But this is good stuff. I mean, this is the day we're living in. And God wants us to do just as Philip did and be obedient with the message to go tell someone in their own environment with their personal what they're going through and tell them how Jesus can intervene in the situation and circumstance. Something that, something that, really, really is cool. Everybody ready for this? Go to Acts chapter 8 for a minute. We'll be done in about another 45 to 50 minutes. Acts chapter 8. The 36th verse. Acts 8, 36, and we're going to read a few verses. Pay attention to this. This is pretty amazing. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. But the eunuch went on his way, what, church? You see, even when God calls you down a road you've never been on before, he still has a plan and a purpose. Now listen to this, church. There is always blessing for the obedience. So I'm going to show you that and prove it in Scripture right here. That even when you go down the path of the unknown, there's blessing coming if you're obedient to travel the path. Here's the proof in the pudding. Acts chapter 8, verse 40. Everybody ready for this? Thank you for the four that are ready. Five. This just blows my shoes off. Acts 8.40 says this. Philip, however, I tell you what, kick it back to the 39th verse because this is important that we read these two together. Verse Acts, Acts 8.39. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, and traveled about, preaching the gospel in what? There's always blessing 
at the end of obedience. In the beginning, we thought Philip had it made. Pay attention to this. At the beginning, we thought Philip had it made because he was preaching in one city. Everybody say one city. We're going to learn this together. He was preaching in one city. God was doing miraculous things in that one city. People were being healed in that one city. According to scripture, there were shrieks coming out of folks and demons and evil spirits were leaving people in in that city. There was some great things going on in that city. Everybody was listening. Everybody was learning. Everybody was loving in that one city. Things was real good. God sends an angel and says, go down that desert road. Philip says, okay. In his obedience, he gets blessed to hear the call of the Spirit of God, and the the Spirit of God says, go stand by that chariot, and again, there's obedience. See, listen, if you're willing to be obedient and do what God says, even if you don't know the outcome, your blessing just might be able to see the outcome when you're obedient. But so many people stay lost because they're not obedient to go, but if you're just willing to go, God will show you the rest, amen? So he gets, he gets blessed for the obedience to go down the road by hearing where he needed to be at the end of it. He gets to the end of it, and he, he has the obedience to tell the man what, what the book of Isaiah was speaking about with Jesus. So he's obedient in teaching. He gets another blessing. He gets a wonderful privilege to baptize the man on the side of the road in some water. Another blessing from obedience. At that moment... They come up, he comes, the, uh, the eunuch comes up out of the water. He's rejoicing. And Philip, because he was faithful to baptize, Philip did what? Tell your neighbor, that means he left. Something supernatural just transpired. Something supernatural just, just transpired because he was obedient to baptize. Now watch this. Because he was obedient to baptize and because he was obedient to leave the one city, according to Scripture, he was preaching in towns all over. All because he was willing to leave one. Don't get so comfortable that you hang on to all that you know because that just might keep you and hinder you from learning and stopping you to grow. Let's stand and pray. For all of those people that are here, and there's 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 no there's no shame here. Listen, there's absolutely no shame. But if you're here and you haven't led someone to Jesus in the past year but you've got a desire to do that, then I'd invite you to just raise your hand right where you are as a sign of faith, not to me, but to your God. And if you've not raised your hand and you've not led someone to the Lord, it's my personal prayer that you would have the desire to lead someone to Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray for each and every one of those individuals who do not Maybe they're here and maybe they just don't understand the importance. I thank you, God, that someone shared the gospel with them. And I pray that they they understand that and they share it with many, many others. I pray for every hand that's in the air. For For every person that has a desire to lead people to Jesus. It doesn't mean that you're a pastor or a preacher or a teacher or an evangelist. What it means is that you're a servant of Jesus. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Father, we lift up those individuals to you that have that hunger and desire. God, I pray that you would let them know who to speak to, what to say, when to say it, how to respond, how to react. May they be in tune with your spirit, Lord. And may they be obedient to travel the lonely road. For all those that are here and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm telling you there's been no better day than today. And if you recognize today that you need Jesus to save your soul, I'm telling you the Word of God says, the Word of God says that that's the only way to heaven is through the Son. 
If you're here today and you recognize that you need to be saved for the first time, I invite you to raise your hand right where you are. You've never done it before, but you know today's your day. And you need that salvation. Anybody. Father, I pray that you would work on the hearts of all of us that you would speak to us, that we would be faithful to your word, and that we would walk in the power of your love. Bless your people today as we depart from one another, and that we walk in honor and favor and blessing. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's people set together, show. Can we give God a clap of praise?